first reading is taken from Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 35, and I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible. The believers share their possessions. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. The Gospel reading is taken from John chapter 20, beginning at verse 19. Jesus appears to his disciples. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord! But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Here endeth the Gospel reading. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. Tim has asked me to draw from today's Bible readings a message of new beginnings as part of our series exploring the new.
and it's our prayer that as spring unfolds and newness is all around, this message of the new will build you up in your inner being and encourage you to press on in following Jesus more closely. On Easter Sunday, Tim and Libby spoke about the offer of new life by choosing Jesus in the garden. Those of us who believe in and profess uh, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus are born again into new and eternal life. Within that new life of Christ, we have innumerable new beginnings by God's mercy, which incidentally is new every morning. And I'm sure we all enjoy new things, new shoes, new friends, new bub buds and bulbs emerging in the garden. But just as new life in Christ follows death to our old life through repentance, so there can be a cost to new beginning. The enduring of the night before the beginning of the new day. The forgetting the former things before the new springs forth in the wilderness. The overcoming of fear or shame or regret or hurt or unforgiveness, the list goes on, in order to step into the new. In Acts, we hear of a beautiful new beginning at the cost of relinquishing individualism and independent wealth. We hear of the beginning of social justice and welfare as wealth is shared. God partnered with the apostles to release this new beginning through their testimony. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. This means that the Holy Spirit, the power of God, was moving in and through their words. The same power that hovered over the formless world as God spoke creation into being. And I believe this supernatural power was released on their testimony because of their alignments, their agreements. First, they were aligned with God because they were testifying to truth. Jesus is the Lord and he is resurrected from the dead. Second, they were aligned with one another in unity. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul. We know from Psalm 133 that unity is treasured and anointed by the Lord. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. And thirdly, they were aligned within themselves. They were individually living with integrity. Their beliefs, words and actions were integrated in holiness. Power was released on the Apostles' testimony because they were aligned with truth, in loving unity and with living with holy integrity. The power of their testimony released a new beginning of God's kingdom on earth. But this is a different outcome to when the apostles first shared their testimony of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Let's take a peek through the keyhole into a locked room described in John 20. A miracle unfolds. The risen Jesus in physical body appears to his disciples. They rejoice when they see the Lord. You would, wouldn't you? And Jesus grants them the peace that he's just won by conquering the war against death. He then details that they will follow in his ministry and he empowers them by his Holy Spirit. But Thomas missed out. And when they come to testify to him, it bombs. It falls flat. Although a valuable seed is sown in him, 
he doesn't believe and so there's no immediate new beginning for him. Infamously dogged, doubting Thomas. Why doesn't he believe the united witness of 10 trusted friends? What's wrong with him? Has he always been a glass half empty doubter? Let's check his credentials. When Jesus and his disciples were in Galilee and hear of Lazarus' death in John chapter 11, the disciples, for fear of the Jews, urged Jesus not to return to Judea to visit. Last time Jesus was there, the Jews threatened to stone him. But look, Thomas pipes up and said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Courageous Thomas, loyal Thomas, so full of love for Jesus in that moment, but there's no room for fear of man, as love casts out all fear. The only other time we hear of Thomas speak is in John 14, when Jesus tells of preparing a place for the faithful in his father's house and says, you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Honest Thomas, not too proud to admit when he doesn't catch on. Courageous, loyal, honest Thomas, a man who's not perturbed by what other people think of him and he's not prone to peer pressure. Why didn't he believe the disciples' true and united testimony? Whilst they were locked in a room for fear of the Jews, where was Thomas? Not locked in a room for fear, I don't know. Maybe he was off joyriding a camel or having a distanced cup of tea in a garden. We don't know, but we do know he wasn't locked in that room for fear of man. Although the ten were aligned with God by testifying to the truth that the Lord Jesus is risen, and they were in unity, they were perhaps not living with full integrity in that moment because they had more fear of man than of God. Why would Thomas believe such a history-changing testimony from a bunch of friends who were cowering in a locked room for fear of man? Notice Jesus's life-giving grace. He appears again and Thomas's love and adoration is uncontainable as he boldly, radically declares, my Lord and my God. It is through these costly testimonies to the resurrection of the Lord that you and I have come to believe. And Jesus declares us blessed for believing without seeing. We thank you, Jesus. In response, each of us have a call to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus for the sake of God's glory and for the sake of new beginnings for the neighbour we're commanded to love. Now, it's not uncommon at, uh, it's not an uncommon reaction for people to defensively quote St. Francis at this suggestion. They say, preach the gospel at all times when necessary, use words, implying that we can testify most effectively without words. This is perhaps the best known, most commonly quoted statement never said by St. Francis. It would have been mildly heretical. He avidly testified to the resurrection and when he couldn't find anyone to listen, he testified to the birds and animals. He would more likely have said, 
Preach the gospel always and for the love of God, use words. But I do understand, it, testifying is costly. It costs us mild social awkwardness, costs time, costs compassion. It costs the overcoming of fear of man. Any testimony to the resurrection of our Lord Jesus can bear fruit of new beginnings. It doesn't have to be perfected eloquence because the Holy Spirit does the work of empowering the testimony. Perhaps consider this a new beginning, to be humble, faithful disciples, unashamed to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Alleluia, Christ is risen, he's risen indeed. Alleluia, amen. Gracious God, giver of peace, planter of justice, spirit of love, we lift up our prayers to you this spring morning. Hope of all hopes, God of new life and of resurrection, we come before you this Easter season, our hearts rejoicing in you. And yet, Despite our joy and hope, we feel the darkness around us. God, may we know your healing presence in that darkness and may your light shine in and through us. Comfort and strengthen us that we may be beacons of your light to those around us. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Mysterious One, you walk among us, but like Thomas, we do not always recognise or believe you to be in our midst. Open our eyes to you, open our ears and our hearts, that we may see you at work in our midst, through our neighbours and in our community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Source of all power, we pray for our leaders in the Church of England and the Christian Church all around the world. We also pray for all the leaders of the world, whether they be government ministers or medics, business leaders or scientists. We pray that they too may recognise you in unexpected places and that instead of vying for power, they may strive to work with and for their constituents. We also pray that these leaders may recognise the equal value of life of all people, whether they be near us or far away. We especially pray for the leaders of our national and local communities in the United Kingdom as they lead us in the daunting task of rebuilding and reimagining our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Maker of the universe, as the world around us bursts into life and colour, we rejoice in your creation. As we re-emerge into the light of our lives, Help us to be good stewards of our home, the earth, a place that we so often take for granted. May we, with awe and wonder, care 
for your creation, the land, the water and the air that sustain and nourish us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of life, as we emerge from lockdown, we think of people who face special challenges. We pray for those facing uncertain futures, perhaps because of lost livelihoods, and who are anxious for all that lies ahead. We also pray for communities across the world facing renewed lockdown and all those continuing to shield and live in isolation. Let us give what we can from our own lives to those in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Source of comfort and peace, we ask that you be with all those who suffer. We bring to you all who grieve. We lift up those who have lost loved ones through illness, old age, disaster or violence. And we pray especially for those who have lost family and friends in this past week. And we now keep a short silence of remembrance for them at this moment. We bring before you those in the world whose lives remain punctuated by war and unrest, and those here in our cities for whom violence is an unquestioned part of their everyday lives. We think particularly of the children who walk to and from school, fearful for their lives and safety in their own homes. And we ask that you direct your comfort and peace, not to us, but instead to all who are staring into the face of fear, anger, hunger, suffering or grief. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Light of the world, you hear all of our prayers, those spoken aloud and those whispered only in the silence of our hearts. Cast your light upon us, gracious one, and accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>